So, um, while people are still taking their seats, I think we should go on and bring up the first presentation. Ida Kristoffersson from VTI. Welcome. <coughs> <coughs> Hello everyone, I'm Ida Kristoffersson from VTI, so it's the Swedish Road and Transport Research Institute. So, one point for saying that. <laughs> okay, but I've done this work together with Anna at ITRL. So, I will talk to you about scenarios for the development of self-driving vehicles in freight transport. So, the scenarios you've heard mentioned here, this is work that is coupled to that. So we presented this work at TRA in Vienna in April. And um, the project was founded by ITRL. And also it was part of this report that is published in March this year um, by the, uh, so the governmental offices of Sweden so has funded it because it's part of the road to self-driving vehicles, the report by Jonas Bjelvenstam that was it's a small part, so about 10 pages <laughs> within <laughs> the 1,000 pages um, report that was published in March, that I'm sure you're aware about. So they've also been funding this project. So the research question for this project was to look at the plausible effect of self-driving technology for the future of road freight transport. So we were not trying to find what will happen, and we're not trying to say what we want to happen, but we are exploring what could happen and create different future pictures, images, and from that it can be a basis for a platform for discussions. So that's the goal, to have a platform to discuss upon what we want in the future. So the method that we used is that we had an expert workshop with 17 road freight experts from nine different organizations. And they had, we had four tables, long haulage, city logistics, driving forces and barriers, and <coughs> benefits and costs. And everyone had the chance to discuss all these themes, so they moved around from the different tables. And then Anna and I sat down and made analysis of all the material we got from the workshop. And we also extended the scenarios for passenger transport that we had developed previously with the freight perspective. So I want to say a big thank you to all the experts and the organizations that contributed to the expert workshop which were both industry, university, Swedish Transport Workers Union, Swedish Association of Road Transport Companies. So we had a different mix of <coughs> stakeholders involved in this process. So the results of the project, we identified some main benefits and costs for the benefits Actually, in freight, there are maybe even more potential for self-driving technology because there is lots of costs to reduce. The cost of the driver and also you can increase the vehicle usage of the vehicles and decrease costs that way. So there is a large potential. And also the expert group saw um, benefits in uh, facilitate nighttime deliveries. So, uh, if there is no driver, you can do. It's easier to have work during night. <coughs> and there can be new types of flexible last mile transport. We had Jenny mentioning drones before. And some of these, uh, you can have benefits already uh, at a lower automation level. Uh, level <coughs> 4, I, I'm sure you're aware about the automation levels, SAE levels, where the 5 is the fully autonomous on driving everywhere, 
and that maybe you need for some of these you need the level five and for some you can have benefits already earlier um, for costs we ident the expert group identified of course the technology cost of self-driving technology and also that it could be more difficult for smaller holiers to invest in this technology and this could create a segregation in the business. That was something that at least I hadn't thought about before coming to the workshop. And we also could have a modal shift from <coughs> rail and sea to road because of improvements of road transport. And of course also this that Anna talked about in the beginning that improving Yes, sorry? Uh, the segregation in business. Well, what, do you, what do you mean by that? So if the technology cost is more difficult, could be more difficult for smaller holiers, which only have five or so uh, trucks to invest in this technology. And that uh, could be a segregation where smaller holiers find it more difficult to, to um, yeah. Yeah, and bigger holiers have uh, an easier time to invest in this and therefore create this segregation. Mm -hmm. And probably there are more, but these were the ones that were identified as the main benefits and costs by the expert group. And then they were also asked about driving forces and barriers. So what will drive the development of self-driving technology and what will hinder it? And here we saw driving force traffic safety. So it's very important for uh, countries to authorities and vehicle manufacturers that we have safe freight transport. And this can also, um, automation will reduce the human errors that is involved in many safety issues in many crashes. Could of course introduce new types of system failures and so on, but still we have a big potential to increase traffic safety. And also a driving force is the, of course, the most important one is the cost reductions. So the re reduction in the cost for a driver and um, to use the vehicle longer. Barriers, we had um, one important is the complex city environment. So for city logistics, it's really a challenge for self-driving vehicles to handle um, people walking, bicycling, the complex environment where you have um, also the infrastructure in the city center. So this is a really challenge. And for long haulage, it's more about adapting, the cost for adapting terminals and infrastructure. So that was seen as a barrier. We also mentioned the need for surveillance and, and also that it, this technology might be perceived as taking driver's jobs, <coughs> even though we have a driver's shortage today. So it could be seen in two ways be seen as solving also the sh problem of driver shortage. Okay, so here are the scenarios that we talked about previously. So we have a scenario cross where the uncertainties, the two main that were identified, um, actually first in the work with the passenger transport, and they were so the role of policy and planning, if it's ambitious and proactive, or more ambitious but slow and careful. And then sharing, so which has been talked about a lot today. So will we have a breakthrough for shared solutions, or will we have uh, no shared solutions breakthrough? So these span somehow the future images that we um, have um, described. And in this, 
we added the freight perspective. So in this top left, we have same, same, but different. This is a scenario where we have an ambitious policy and planning, but no shared solutions breakthrough. And in this scenario for freight, we have kilometer charges, um, advanced truck driver assistance, but not so many fully self-driving applications. Um, truck platooning and diesel vehicles banned from city centers. So this is a very environmental scenario which focuses on environmental and electrification is really in focus, but not so much on shared solutions and cooperation, cooperative solutions are lacking. And then we have sharing is the new black. In this scenario, it's both um, ambitious policy and planning and shared solutions breakthrough. So for freight, and we have, it's mandatory for freight transport to share data to the state. So share data about um, the vehicle, the conditions on the roads, the weather and so on, and all types of uh, data. So there's a lot of um, this cooperative, and you, even between brands you need to share your data. And um, consolidation of goods, but Big Brother sees everything is of course the um, downside of that scenario. <coughs> and then we have follow the path, which, which is a form of, okay, the trend <coughs> from today going further. Uh, for um, freight, we identify that this will be, Asia will lead the development, so not so many fully self-driving um, applications in Sweden. Um, and we will have more autonomous rather than cooperative systems and um, truck platooning, but not so many fully self-driving applications. And then we have the last one, which is what you need is what you get. This is really what Olaf described somewhere. Where are you? Here you are. Yeah, so the one with Google and Amazon and where they Customer insight is key factor. So you, you based on data, you create tailored solutions for transport. And there's an explosion of these type of services. And also for delivery solutions. So you deliver your food directly to your home, to your fridge, based on what you need, based on um, what they know that you have in your fridge. And we have a focus on city logistics. So this is a market-driven scenario. So where it's um, the solutions are there if it is um, possible to make money on them. So therefore, mainly cities um, will, yeah, will benefit from this technology in this scenario. So. Well, what can we say about conclusions? Well, we have identified both positive and negative social consequences. And what you... So the contribution of this technology to sustainability and to social effects is really how we use it. So it depends also on policy and regulation. It depends on infrastructure investments and business ecosystems. So. And it's not obvious if it will be passenger or freight leading the development. So if it's cost effective, probably freight will lead. But if it's uh, more other, driven by other values, passenger might lead uh, the development of self-driving vehicles. And we have really differing opportunities and challenges in city logistics and in long haulage. So for city logistics, it's mainly this complex traffic environment that is the big challenge. And in for long haulage, uh, it's more um, about the cost of terminals and infrastructure. Yes, yeah, so that was all I had today. Thank you.
we have some time for questions. Uh, you mentioned barriers. Uh, and, uh, have, you, have you looked into the, uh, the society acceptance of, uh, to uh, illuminate the driver with the railways in comparison? No, we haven't looked into that, but it seems like an interesting area. Um, so you mean that it could have been done already for railway, quite easy, um, yeah, it's on their own uh, rail? And uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, it's, it's a more technical <coughs> challenge to illuminate a, a road vehicle driver with, compared to the, the, yeah. the trains. Um, and I can't see technical pro uh, problems of or, or concern to, to, to illuminate the, 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 but the, the life train. cycle but is much... It hasn't happened. No, so I don't know. But the life cycle in railway is much longer, so the trains are used, so small uh, trucks could be used, it's a turnover time is <coughs> shorter, so that could be one. Absolutely. I, I, I haven't no answer. I just no. was curious about... Yeah, I'm, it's an interesting area to look why it hasn't happened for railway. That's, that's true. Yeah. I'm curious about... You mentioned robots and drones. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, Mercedes-Benz has this solution where you have, a, you could say, a truck that delivers yeah. packages and then you have a lot of a fleet, maybe, or, or at least one drone that delivers it to the guy up in the mountain, you could say, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then you have Starfleet uh, looking at the drones in Estonia, that uh, they are more drone dro uh, droids mm -hmm. uh, going on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any time to look at those? And are there any like scenario of how they could, uh, uh, say, be a solution for the last mile of delivery? We did just uh, briefly, we didn't look into that very much. Yeah. I just got but curious because you mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah, it was more one of these innovative, so that the expert group identified and uh, this type of new types of flexible last mile services is one of those, an example of those. Okay. But, yeah. Yes. Uh, is there any concern? Uh, from aspect of driver or other human resource of system to do their job <coughs> and anything else when the system goes to automation? Yeah, this has been raised, but we also had Swedish Transport Workers Union in the workshop and they really want to, they see the technology it could also assist and to make the driver occupation um, uh, more um, how to say, maybe you can work while driving or you can sleep, so it can also be a benefit to a truck driver. So they see it positively, this technology, <coughs> I would say. But of course there is resistance also. So. Thank you. Hey, we need to move to the next one. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. So, uh, the next presentation is from our own Joram and Mikke, who will talk about aerostatics. Electric rooms, yes. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, so, uh, electric rooms. We will talk about this, uh, me, Mikkel Helgren, and... Mm -hmm. Joram Lankrock. Yes. <coughs> so, I think I will start with some slides here. Uh, and then you continue. So, what would we talk about? Uh, overview of different technologies for electric roads, very short. Uh, and what ITRL uh, are doing up in uh, Arlanda, where we have one e-road. And then we also talk about the Airset project, uh, that you will know more about later. So, some different technologies for e-roads. So we have um, either we could have conductive in on road. So you put something on the road or in the road and take up electricity to your vehicle. 
Uh, there is also one system, I think, from Honda taking up electricity from the side of the road. Yeah. <coughs> and then we also have another solution with uh, overhead uh, wires uh, that is conductive, like a train system, but for roads. So you build up uh, wires in the air over the road, and then you on the truck or bus or whatever, you have something that connects to that one. And then you can go for inductive solution as well. And then you dig down in the road a lot of uh, copper wires, so you can induce energy up to the vehicle. And that's another solution. And the one I'm going to talk about now is the railway solution that is conductive in the road. <clears throat> and uh, what we have then is um, a rail. If you cut it, uh, then you can see that it consists of some E profile, and then we have some parts here that are conductive, some metal, and then isolation, and then we have some grounding part up here, protective earth. So you put down something here that is a pickup and then take out electricity from here while you're driving. And uh, the vehicle have to be, have to have a pickup that is mounted. This is direction of uh, travel for the vehicle. And then you can see in the front here, it's a little bit angled, the nose. I will talk more about that later on. And then down here, you go down and take up electricity. And then you connect with the wires up to the electric vehicle. And then you can charge batteries or use the energy for propulsing the vehicle. Or both, usually. Is it heated? Sorry? Is it heated? Ah, that is <laughs> two slides <laughs> <laughs> I will talk about. <laughs> Frequently asked okay. questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so advantages with this technique when you put it in the road. That is uh, one thing is all vehicles can use it. Both uh, heavy vehicles and ordinary cars. I'm not sure if motorbikes can use it, but I wouldn't dare to test it. And <coughs> then it's a fairly small amount of work for uh, putting this in the road and then you have to put the wires to some uh, control system beside the road so you switch in uh, like 50 meters at a time uh, otherwise uh, you, you, you don't put electricity in the whole length all the time just 50 meters so here we are. Does it work with gravel, snow, ice, salt? Usually when I talk to people and say that I work with a little bit with electric roads, they say, oh, but does it work with snow and ice, gravel? Um, and yes, d does it. Uh, we tested with, uh, for example, gravel. We filled up like a little bit more than a centimeter in the, in the rail and then we took the vehicle and ran over it with the uh, pickup in the rail and as I said it was a little bit angled in the front and that was for having an angle here so the mud and things should go away when passing and afterwards yes then it was a few stones left here small uh, very small parts and most of it had blown up on the sides and it was possible to take out electricity in the meantime so yes uh, that that worked if it's totally filled with gravel of course it doesn't work then you have to clean it in some way first <coughs> and then winter that's another problem what uh, here in Sweden we have for sure some special winter, or w a lot of winter, <coughs> sometimes. Uh, and we have tested it, in fact, three winters. 
Um, and uh, if you have ordinary like snowfall, not too much, then it's no problem. It will clean itself and work. If it's very much snow or wet snow, then it could be that you need some heating. And yes, there are some heating in the rail. And also in the, uh, you have some, uh, the water should be able to go away uh, from the road. So there you have some heating parts. And uh, that is of course interesting, how much energy will we use for heating here? That's a question we'll try to answer later on. Um, if we get a very icy condition, then we need heating for sure. It's not possible to take away another way, way <coughs> than heating. And then we also have salt. And that is, uh, usually it could be, uh, I mean, if you have salt in water, uh, the possibility for electricity to travel there is higher. So uh, you will have more leakage current in the system going out. Uh, and that could be a problem in some uh, cases, especially if, if the joints between these 50 meter sections are not perfectly isolated. Uh, so, but there are solutions for this. So I would say, yes, it, it could work mm -hmm. here. It w what we have seen, it works. And <coughs> this has been some problem, but I think uh, with the right solution, yes, it could work. Absolutely. So, some uh, data we have measured that to take out, out uh, 150 kilowatt from the system while driving up to 70 kilometers an hour, and that works. Uh, we have also measured uh, <coughs> if the truck is standing on the rail charging that it shouldn't do, it should run. But standing still, if we could touch it and stand here or if it's lethal in some way. Uh, but we measured, we didn't touch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, it was no danger. It was very small voltages you could measure there. Uh, but it shouldn't be done. And um, what happens if the rail will be filled up with water by some reason? Uh, will it be dangerous then if you have 800 volts there? Uh, so we measured that as well, and uh, no, it was no problem, it was millivolt we could measure, no more. Uh, if we had salt water, a little bit more, but no danger still. But this is, uh, the idea is that no pedestrian should be on the road when you have electricity there. Uh, yes, and then we tested this safety uh, part that it should only put in 50 meters at the time. And uh, we could see that uh, the technique was working for that. Uh, from the beginning there was problem of course, but in the end they got some working te the technology for that. Noise, we have measured noise. Will it be more noisy with this pickup going in the rail? And uh, what we could see was for joints, it could be some small excitation of the mechanical structure. So it sent away some noise, but that was like milliseconds. So otherwise it's very unnoisy, I would say. And uh, if you compare it to a normal truck, uh, then for sure it's lower level if, the, if you have some load on the engine and in the motor for this electric truck. So, some conclusion. Yes, we have seen a working system, but of course it could be improved, what we have seen so far. So that's about uh, our measurements up in Arlanda. We'll continue with this until 2019 and hopefully we'll run it in commercial 
uh, use during winter now. So that will be interesting. Okay, Joram. Okay. I will continue with uh, another project at ITRO that's called an, uh, Electric Road Systems Engineering Toolbox. And um, as opposed to the previous project, this is more, let's say, a, um, a system level um, uh, research project. So anticipating on what if technical challenges have been solved for the different technical solutions, how, how should we implement this in the real world um, on a bigger scale? Um, so the aim, the aim was to go beyond demonstration projects and then um, we have different schools at, at KTH as well as RISE and also traffic work it was, um, was involved to look at different perspectives to this electric road systems topic and they're both um, rather technical or energy system model as we made vehicle model but also um, looking at maintenance so if you have cars and vehicles in an, in an inductive system that have to drive more straight on a specific part of the road will there be more uh, pressure on these parts of the road so that you have to maintain these roads more often and what are the CO2 consequences of that one um, but also to look at the, at the yeah, social and economic aspects so we have gathered a lot of, of different uh, departments at KTH and also outside of KTH um, to look at stakeholder analysis, business models, and uh, something that was called the decision theater of all the involved people. And ITRL was the coordinator and was doing some kind of synthesis. So here are a few uh, examples of, of impact. Okay, um, what can we, when, if we want to select where to, to uh, install these electric roads. So. Uh, we found that the energy efficiency increases and that's, that you have most energy efficiency on uphills. I was writing here also time efficiency. Um, because trucks that go uphill normally, um, probably you have been driving uh, behind them, that goes quite slowly. But in the, in the vehicle and uh, uh, um, modeling system, they have shown that, that it also goes faster, so there are time gains. Some different selection criteria were investigated. So, is it the number of vehicles, number of trucks on a specific road? That is a good way to select these trucks we would like to, to provide with electric road systems or specific vehicles that often come there again and again and again. Uh, so, identi identical vehicles that visit the specific road again and again or geographical aspects uphill so um, you always have energy efficiencies <laughs> but it appeared that these, these ones are uh, by uh, yeah uh, much larger on uphills than on on downhills obviously um, but in the future we might also want to know okay if we want to have a partially electric road system network maybe we, we would look at where do the people live and maybe they should be installed close to ring roads where there are a lot of people that are rather living rather close by. Electric road system construction implies higher CO2 emissions, especially if you have extra maintenance. And that depends on the technology. <coughs> For example, in some cases you can have additional pressures on the roads. Another perspective was to look at the organization and coordination of, uh, of case studies of electric road systems. And we were looking at uh, one system where they have this um, like trolley bus or train system uh, close to uh, Jävle Sandviken and uh, then E-Road Arlanda. And there, are, there was a difference in how was it managed, this project. Because that could be an example of how could larger scale electric road systems be organized. And we really saw like the centralized versus decentralized, where you have different actors that all have their input. Um, also based on, on data of, of, of heavy duty Scania trucks, um, they were identifying okay, the heavy duty vehicles that <laughs> were often making use of a specific road. And there they were looking at, okay, busy roads, lots of, of uh, heavy duty vehicles in general, or specific, yeah? so maybe in the beginning um, we should 
look at specific stretches between A and B and between a mine and a, yeah, uh, a mine and the harbor, for example, and there we could install these electric roads. And then we were um, discussing the results of this analysis with some experts, and they gave they gave their plan or scenarios of where should we install electric roads before knowing about this measured patterns and then after to look at this decision theater how can we with the help of both data and experts uh, opinions get this uh, uh, yeah an optimal solution during our last project meeting we were having some ideas for future research should there be a place for electric road systems especially for also for light duty vehicles and there, um, yeah, we see that the batteries, they become better, so maybe it's not necessary, um, but still for the very long distance trips, there might still be uh, an, an added value for electric road systems. From the cost-benefit analysis point of view, if the electric road system is the reason why people adopt electric vehicles, then we can expect huge societal benefits. If it's just like they make it more convenient for people that anyhow would uh, switch to electric vehicles, then you cannot, let's say, count them as extra benefits. And what is the willingness to pay? So maybe you should look, okay, would people uh, be willing to pay extra money to, be, to provide their cars with accessibility for electric road systems? Yeah, that was the last one. Thank you so much. Do you have any quick questions before moving on to choose time? Otherwise you can always come up to these two guys afterwards and ask them directly. Yes. Okay, one? No problem with the radio communication or radar uh, at Orlando due to spark uh, <laughs> transmission <laughs> from the electrical type as engineer and need to try to find some problems. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I promise you, there are problems. <laughs> but uh, we have measured uh, EMC yeah. from uh, 50 megahertz up to 1,500. And in that, uh, we couldn't find anything. We have made some very late measurements <coughs> on conducted, uh, uh, conducted uh, emissions. And uh, we can find something there for sparks, yes. What's more? Ah, yes, sparks? something okay. interesting. <laughs> 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we've heard about the project focusing on uh, connection automation, one on efficient vehicles or transport, and now we're moving on to the business models uh, with Anna Klamisch. I'm not too only okay. business model. <laughs> no, but you tell us. <laughs> okay. Welcome. Uh, thank you. So I'm Anna Kramers. I'm a program manager for uh, Mistra SAMS, Sustainable Accessibility and Mobility Services. But I'm also a research area responsible here at I ITRL for mobility services. And I will present the one of the first um, results from Mistra SAMS, which is an article that uh, me, Tina Ringesson, and Lili Dona, raise your hand. <laughs> And uh, Peter Arnpak has uh, written, and we presented it in, at the ICT4S conference in Toronto uh, just two weeks ago. So I will ju just go through this. And, um, so we wanted to uh, try to identify which of these services are promising or not. And we, we not only look at uh, uh, mobility as a service, we also look at accessibility as, as a uh, service. So this paper is the first part out of two. So this is what I will present today, this ongoing work where we have identified the indicators. Next step um, is to, we're right now testing the indicators on a database of services that we, ha we have gathered. Uh, and that leads to that the indicators are getting better. We, we see that they need to be adjusted. And we would like, we will send, we have already submitted that paper into uh, 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 special uh, edition of sustain the uh, journal sustainability uh, it's about information and communication technologies for sustainability but we will also uh, make another paper where we present the result of the testing of the actual 
uh, services. But that, that will be the next time I present that, so, so, so you will <laughs> bear on me, I will just give some glimpses on which are the most promising. So why do we do this? Uh, we do this because we like to guide policy makers, decision makers and business developers, and also academia, uh, to understand how can, how can we find out which are the most promising and in, in, in what way are they promising. The services that we look at, it's not only mobility as a service, it's accessibility as a service. Because we, we think that these can be combined, and you can combine uh, services for accessibility in the same way as you combine mobility as a service. You know, mobility as a service already exists, like WIM, YubiGo, these kind of solutions today. But we haven't seen accessibility package as a service, and not the, the two together. That is also something that you can do. Uh, to put together uh, the possibility to not travel to reach what you want. So what do we mean by accessibility? We mean the ability of individuals to participate in necessary or desired activities for the well-being of humanity. Um, yeah, so it's both for, the, for yourself and for other people. Uh, and we took the definition from Waters. Uh, and mobility, uh, we, we took uh, John Aris' uh, definition. He said that mobility can be divided into four categories. Corporal mobility of people moving physical through space. Object mobility of waste or goods. And imaginative travel, such as radio and, and TV or virtual travel. So these are the ones we call accessibility. We haven't, we are not directly looking into waste, the mobility of waste and goods in Mr. Sams. So we are m mainly looking at moving of people. Uh, but it could be that we also connect in indirect ways to goods. So we wanted to see in this, when we, we try to identify what kind of indicators are we going to have. So we, we said that we would like to see if the service can reduce negative impacts on the environment. And is the service rewardable? Is value created for an organization or not? And how widely is the service spread? How many users are there? What is the geographic distribu distribution and what level of society tr transition has occurred because of the service? So we created this framework with different indicators uh, on the di uh, different parts. I will, I, I will go th through them slightly. Um, so on the environmental side, it's the reduce of traveling o overall, uh, reduce of en environmental impact per traveled kilometer. Uh, this is where we have five different indicators. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I will have, I can break them up so we can have a look at them a little bit more. Uh, and also s the spread we, we divided into geographical distribution, adaptation, adoption, and also uh, societal transition. We created a database uh, with these kind of services and divided them, uh, divided them into uh, access without travel. There we have all the types of application for telework, virtual meetings and conferencing, e-health, distance education, entertainment, media and gaming, remote control and surveillance, e-commerce. Uh, the non-motorized mobility support, there are lots of apps that support walking, uh, support bicycling, uh, shared access, both for public transport, sharing of cars, sharing of bicycle and also sharing of space. Uh, because we also see that sharing of space for for instance when for working you can have a co-working hub as a concept where you can work where you want and parking access is also something that you share the parking which has to do with mobility uh, and then we have uh, aggregators for mobility as a server oh, this is wrong now because it should be mobility aggregators uh, uh, aggregators and mobility as a service is the only aggregate so this is the, I took the wrong picture, this should be here. Aggregators, we only see mobility as a service as aggregated today. We, we haven't seen other, any other services aggregated in the same way as mobility as a service. Uh, 
And then there are car travel efficiency applications for eco driving, road planning, and things like that. Yeah, so, so this is how, how we, we made the indicators. Um, uh, let's see what, when did I start? Um, five minutes ago. Five minutes so ago. It's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so the first category is what I said earlier reduce traveling overall, and then one of the indicators how many trips are, are you making? If you haven't asked, you don't make any trip at all. Uh, does it encourage batching of, of activities that this service helps you to do uh, different kind of errands at the same time? How long is the distance of the trip? D does it encourage neighborhood based activities? Um, and the second indicator reduce environmental impact per traveled kilometer. Uh, and then we see, does it encourage shift to walking, which is, would be the best? Does it encourage shift to biking and then public transportation? And then also we look into the type of car and vehicle emissions that is, that is, that is. So this is what we have applied on the database, uh, but I can't give you the result uh, of that until next time when we have that article ready. Um, and these are the business value indicators that we combine. Uh, you look at different business model archetypes, um, uh, different profit models, and there you can see uh, that the sharing economy, which is uh, considered to be uh, uh, more sustainable, uses a subscription uh, and use-oriented way of uh, having their business models. Um, it, the framework, when, when you use the framework, you, you really get a lot of information about these services and you un understand that it's really understandable a shift, that th there will be a shift to, to um, uh, a su subscription model because you earn much more. You know uh, Airbnb, then you can rent out your flat for, uh, I mean, if you rent it out to a person living there for a long time, you, you can only, in Stockholm you could, <laughs> for a small apartment, get 10,000 uh, kroner per month, but if you rent it out every week, you can get 10,000 per week, and, and I think it's the same with cars. So the car uh, manufacturers understand this. So. Uh, Volvo and others, they are looking into how they can make cars that they can sell more times. The same car can be sold several times and can be used much more, which of course will give more revenues to Volvo. And they can also probably reduce cost, cost of the <coughs> actual product. But as we heard from Trafikverket this morning, uh, one problem with all this, which we also saw when we used it, is that there are now companies like uh, Uber, for instance, where they already have established themselves. They already have the contacts with the users. Uh, so so they, for them it's quite easy just to, to change, to, to, to put in next service and next. So the thing is that I think here in Sweden it's a problem for us because we don't really have these uh, companies that has got the contact with the user. I mean, the, the operator, Telia Sonar, Sonar, they have contact with the operators. Ericsson, Scania, they have business to business uh, uh, business models. Uh, but we, you need, when you establish this service and, and uh, would like to create a lot of revenues, then you need to have the connection to the users. Uh, and I think that is something we, we need to consider how we should handle that in the future. We also saw the, the, the bikes, the sharing of bikes, you know, the Chinese bikes that are spread all over the world. Uh, why do they do that? We don't know really yet. They have their own business model today, but if you look at them, you understand that they have, they have a partner up with Huawei and with China Mobile, which means that what is it they're doing? <laughs> they're establishing a connection to the users and they also put out the Internet of Things products in the market. Uh, what will be their next step? We don't know that yet. 
So what, what uh, this is really some a lot of different things going on that we don't really we don't really see it because it's uh, on 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 the other side of the scene, so to say, it's hidden a little bit if you don't look at it narrow more narrow. Uh, we also wanted to know uh, where does these services, where are they available? Uh, what countries, what types of cities are they available in? Uh, and where are they spread? Do they exist only in the central uh, urban region, in the city center or in the suburbs? Or is it also in the rural outer suburbs or remote? Is there any difference? <coughs> How many users are there? That's very difficult to find. It's more easy to understand uh, the market share, how the market will grow, and also look backwards to see how fast it has grown. Many of these servers have really had this type of hockey stick curve that they have really uh, taken off this uh, the last few years. Uh, and how many users are there? This last one, we wanted to see what kind of uh, what kind of transition has occurred because of this service, and I think we need to. This is one of the indicators that we need to rephrase a little bit. But because all of these services are niche solutions, and uh, they get help from what they, in the multi-level perspective talk, talk about landscape, because we have in all we have the agreement on on. The, um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030, uh, which means that there is a pressure from, from the uh, countries and uh, societies on the regime, but the regime hasn't really started to change. The laws, regulation, norms, these kind of things has, has not really taken off. It has, we looked at, for instance, video conferencing. I think that is one of the services that ha has come the farthest in the regime area, but it, um, no, this is not. so the conclusion is uh, why there is a need for two to support public and private organizations. That's because transport is a major contributor to climate and environmental impacts, and the current measures are insufficient to change the private car regime. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, we will not reach the, the, the goals with this uh, pace that we have now. And digitalization holds a really potential to reduce the emission from the transport sector. And digitalization has really got uh, a potential and it has, uh, I mean, it has transformed many sectors, including media, communication, music and banks during the last 20 years. And there is now initiative also to uh, uh, accelerate uh, this <coughs> by an initiative driven from Sweden and the, the together with Johan Rockström and also the Future Earth to to um, to uh, really accelerate <coughs> the way we use digitalization for uh, curbing climate emissions. Uh, yeah, but there is there are also drawbacks, of course, of the digital technology. Mm -hmm. uh, it has its own carbon emission, even though at the same conference there was a paper presented that said that uh, that <coughs> uh, even if we now use this uh, digital media more than before, it has increased tremendously. Uh, the energy use has has gone down on a global perspective. So there is a paper presented by Telia Zanera and Ericsson research uh, about this, which you can find in the conference proceedings. <coughs> and there is, of course, a problematic waste handling with ICT, and also there are rebound effects, which we need to take care of as well. OK, maybe <laughs> that was a little bit too long. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for uh, thank you for a very interesting pick. Oh, yeah, I talked to you uh, before this, yeah. and I find it very good that you're talking about indicators. The thing is, uh, when you had the AAAS, Accessibility as a Service, mm -hmm. I was a bit happy first, because I thought this is like 
fashion store, you know, for dis disabled people. Oh, yeah. You know, but it's not exactly that. No, it's not. Yeah. But my mother is disabled and she's using fat chance and mm -hmm. that sometimes is used as a ride sharing yeah, phenomena, yeah. which she really doesn't like. Sometimes mm -hmm. she likes it because she can talk to other people, mm -hmm. but many times everything gets delayed. They mm -hmm. have to wait for people. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering because when you're talking about the value of the, the re reward, rewarding mm -hmm. part of the service, mm -hmm. you mentioned organizations, but mm -hmm. you didn't mention users. Uh, no, and uh, that's true. Uh, so this is, I mean, this is just a limited part of indicators that is needed for this field. Uh, and we started to look into this. Uh, we have a large uh, part in our program that will also look into users and their preferences. So this is just a very small part of Mr. Sams, which it was the starting point, so to say. Uh, but then we will do a lot of we will have living labs. We have. Uh, we will have. We will do um, surveys with user preferences and things like. So we will get more information on that. Uh, so it was therefore. I should have said that in the beginning. It's limited to more economic and environmental perspectives. Hmm. Any more questions? <coughs> okay. Hmm? Thank you. Again.